guys, what's up? Hi. It's not an understatement that the Traveler was merely let off the hook because Arlecchino needed them to properly kill the traitors of the House of Hearth. For the first time in a long time, after 500 years, since losing to the sustainer of the Heavenly Principles, our Traveler was almost obliterated by a potential opponent that's considerably and maybe even leagues far more powerful than them. Not only was this due to Arlecchino's innate curse-like power from Conria's previous dynasty, the Crimson Moon Bloodline, which is oddly similar to the Gnostic Chorus's Queen of Darkness, Arlecchino's own combat skills and ability while showcasing what seemed like a fraction of her power as the fourth harbinger of the Fatui. Unbeatable to the point that even the classic power of friendship plot armor wasn't enough to even put a dent on her. So how is it that Arlecchino possesses this power from a fallen kingdom then? Well, a part of that is due to Arlecchino's roots with the Crimson Moon, of which is tied to her bloodline through a book recommended to her by Piero. The other is from Arlecchino's Fallen Shadows and its relation to the same long-dead possible shadow of the Crimson Moon. A set of events we only caught a glimpse of in her story quest but is better explained within her character lore. So going over all of that, we'll also talk about some related lore that would shed some light on the origins of Arlecchino's roots. A short in-depth look with timestamps already below Low, that will hopefully make her already terrifying presence and your experience with her lore more understandable and a lot more enjoyable. Ignis Purgatorius When the Hearth Flame Goes Out The first act in Arlecchino's story quest. Something I'm sure was revealed to us already is the huge power gap between the fourth harbinger, Arlecchino, and our very own traveler. Even with the help of the Hearth siblings, we still weren't able to beat even a few seconds of Arlecchino's quote-unquote true Power. Granted, we weren't exactly winning on our own against Karamush and the Archons either. Comparisons aside, however, it's clear that Arlecchino's Crimson Moon power is a force to be reckoned with, and is a primer for what else the remaining top 3 Harbingers have in store for us in the future. Now whether or not this is actually her true power is still up to speculation, since she only got serious for about 30 seconds before nearly turning the MC into Crimson Mist. Arlecchino's power stems from three sources, all of which are flames that are seemingly indistinguishable from each other. First and foremost is her Crimson Bloodfire, which courses through her body like blood, an inherited power born from a lineage of nobles during the Crimson Moon Dynasty. She deems this power as both a blessing and a curse, and it is greatly tied to her emotions, particularly sorrow and anger. A bloodline that cannot succumb to their emotions and is forced to be emotionless. Arlecchino's ties to the Crimson Moon are so ingrained in her blood that she even dreams of the Crimson Moon, yet her actual ability to utilize this blood fire as well as its origin is still vaguely explained. Her weapon, her outfit description, as well as her boss description suggest that those of her bloodline bestowed upon themselves this blessing and curse by worshipping and praying to the Crimson Moon, longing for transcendental beings to build towers and reach the firmament of the Abyss. Which is interesting because the Abyss didn't exactly have a firmament at least not until now. This would imply that they were praying and worshipping the corpse of a moon sister that once watched over the world and is now found in the abyss. Or if Arlecchino's powers and revelations reflect the key details of the book Perrin Harry, a ghost of a once sovereign moon sister, a shadow as well as the remnant ghosts of those who have fallen, now crimson with vengeance and sorrow, and found in the shadows where light does not reach, which is the abyss. Since these shadows appear as a result of Arlecchino's ties to the Crimson Moon bloodline, then it's likely that its origins also possess the same characteristics. Perrin Harry saw a quote-unquote illusion and the Crimson Moon turning and revealing itself to be a horrified eye. Now, if we interpret this as the Crimson Moon being replaced by a dark sun, as eclipses are two celestial bodies blocking each other, then it would also be akin to shadows like Clervy that disappears as the sun rises, or as the crimson moon eclipse finishes and is replaced by the dark sun. This phenomenon could reflect the manifested shadows like Clervy to someone like Angelica in Perrin Harry, who also disappeared as the sun rose after Perrin Harry's battle, as well as Leobrand turning into what seems like a hilly churl after leaving Conria, which we'll talk about in a bit. 
Now, the worship of the Crimson Moon, regardless if it's an actual carcass or a shadow of a moon sister, was the result of this cursed blessing that Arlecchino, as well as her bloodline, possess. Both a blessing and a curse that runs through the noble lineage of the Crimson Moon bloodline. Something worth noting is that under special circumstances, Arlecchino's Bale Moon Bloodfire, when extracted from her person, is also capable of erasing memories when ingested. The special circumstance of which these flames can can be extracted are still unknown, but we can see what this blood fire looks like from her boss drops. A silken feather made of both blood, fire, and dark threads. Red just like the crimson moon's light and the blood of humanity, and darkness like the bottom of the abyss that will emerge from the crimson moon. The threads are bound into the flame and blood, which we can see from her boss fight as well. And these dark threads that allow flame and blood to form into solid various objects, like strings, spikes, wings, limbs, as well as a scythe, is what a semblance of the Crimson Moon can look like. Which could explain why Arlecchino's spear can turn into a blood scythe an outward appearance of something that is entirely different from reality. Like when you see a dog showing a smile, but in reality it's baring its teeth to prepare for a fight. And as we've seen, even Arlecchino does this in her entire story, hiding her real intentions versus what she actually says with a carefully made facade to fool others. Like saying to kill a person, when in reality she means to kill the memory of that person. To Arlecchino, a life in the hearth is a tainted life. And the only way for their sins to be washed over is by killing that life, rather the memory of that life. Which is how she described the children with Nouvellet when she used water as an analogy. Tainted water cannot simply be accepted into a large body of water, and few are willing to even sip from a glass with tainted waters. But with her bottled flames, the tainted waters or children will be strained and returned to its purest form, giving those who lived in a tainted life another chance at a more pure life. The only downside I could think of here is that the Torre now knows of Arlecchino's Pale Moon Bloodfire. And knowing the Torre, he can probably make use of that and find a way to exploit Arlecchino in some way at some point in the story. Moving on, her pyrovision, which she got in her early childhood, since she was under the quote-unquote care of her mother, Crusabina. Something worth noting with her vision story and her voice lines is that she also suggests the notion that a desire of sufficient intensity is enough to warrant an answer from the gods. Similar to Nouvellet and Forina's vision lores. So long as you're crazy enough to desire something at the cost of nearly giving your life away, then the transaction between the gods of Celestia and their more abundant rewards has already been made, and will then be repaid to change fate thousands of years after your death. But Arlecchino sees her vision as proof of her defiance of fate and her command over her own future, which is true for all vision holders and the fate that they can change thousands of years after, even though it is tied to the establishment of the Seven Archons. Her delusion, on the other hand, which she received after being punished with being the new knave, is her third catalyst of power which also served as her badge of honor and proof of favor from the Tsaritsa, even though Arlecchino wouldn't hesitate to turn her blade against her own Archon. To refresh your memory, I should also state that only few individuals outside of the Harbingers, such as Arlecchino, possess delusions. The few examples are the Sisin Mages, Fatui Agents, Mirror Maidens, as well as Fatui Operatives. Other forms like mass-produced delusions like the one that Tepe has, as well as rare and still unknown origin of delusions like Diluc and his father, Crepus's delusion. These catalysts are personally granted and given by the Tsaritsa herself, while its production and origins are speculated to be from deceased gods. Arlecchino's relation to the House of Hearth is also akin to another key detail of the book Perrin Harry, reflecting the lore of the Crimson Moon Dynasty. A long time ago, a kingdom would create an orphanage to receive and take care of children from other worlds as well as waiting for transcendental beings. And in a strange twist of fate, after becoming a harbinger, that same orphanage was now run by an orphan of that same lineage, meaning the House of Hearth's first owner was run by one of the nobles of the Crimson Moon dynasty. 
and that the House of Horth is likely a long-standing orphanage that has been part of Conria ever since the Crimson Dynasty. An orphanage that takes in shipwrecked sailors as well as transcendental beings from outer space. Descenders if we look back at Perrin Harry and the House of Hearth, Angelica being a symbol of freedom as well as disappearing as the sun rises does have similarities to Clervy and her expression of freedom from the hearth. Although this is a minor detail, it could be a key detail that Piero wishes for Arlecchino to understand. Freedom is what the children of the hearth longed for when under the care of Crusabina, and to be free from the House of Hearth would cost their lives. Again, in a strange twist of fate, the orphans of Conria would be free at the cost of becoming hilly churls, as the original House of Hearth can only let descendants of those who forsook their own gods in, but letting them out would mean becoming howling beasts, just like Leobrandt. While Arlecchino's powers come from the Crimson Moon dynasty and can be traced from the book Perrin Harry, the origins of this dynasty are still vague and speculative. As mentioned by Piero, Perrin Harry does have key details that are worth noting when it comes to Arlecchino's powers and the Crimson Moon. The events within the story are specious, meaning that they are plausible but are likely wrong. An inaccurate or misleading telling of events that is told in a different way. An allegory. The start of this bloodline also wasn't stated apart from the Crimson Moon Dynasty as well as a very strong clan. But I think this dynasty began at the same time as the Gnostic Choruses events. The first instance of what we thought of was the Abyss wasn't blue like Dainsliff or purple like Tartalia and some of the Abyss Order. It was red. And funnily enough, the Gnostic Serpent had two glowing eyes, red and purple. And the first temptation that was used on this heir who wanted to get the Genesis Pearl was, of course, red. So this could be the initial period of the Crimson Dynasty. But it's worth noting that this is not the origin of the Abyss. The ruler's gender or sex wasn't mentioned, but this ruler also seemed gullible and easily spoken to by the sages. The same way the Queen of Darkness would also be gullible after being deceived and having her memories wiped. Interestingly enough, she is also seen drinking a red fluid from a chalice which I could only think of as crimson blood fire that erases memories. The thorns and the structure of the Queen of Darkness' throne not only look similar to Arlecchino's, but the chalice of which she drinks from is similar to Arlecchino's outfit description, Moon Glare. And that same ceremony of drinking from a cup or a chalice persisted in much of the Crimson Moon's lore. Almost all of it, actually. And still persists even after the Crimson Moon Dynasty's fall, which happened with a muddle-minded king. This segment is more speculative of Conria's dynasties than Arlecchino's origins, but it's worth mentioning since it could explain how Conria's Black Sun Dynasty fell to the sages of the Crimson Moon. Based on the Crimson Moon semblance's lore, the muddle-minded ruler of what seemed like the Black Sun Dynasty was also deceived. This we can assume was a king of Conria who ingested the Crimson Chalice, possibly the Crimson Bloodfire which could wipe someone's memory. Now if we assume that this muddled king was King Ermin, the ruler of Conria before the Cataclysm, who was also indisposed and had failed his strength, then the astrologists or sages of King Ermin would end up asking him to take responsibility for being the Crimson Moon, letting him drink from the chalice and ingest the same red fluid, wiping his memory and changing his identity into this. It sort of aligns with why the statuettes that the Serpent Knights drop slowly become red and spiky. The spikes also look like Arlecchino spikes. But the only difference here is that instead of re-establishing the Crimson Moon during the Black Sun's dynasty, what happened here was that the astrologists now branded as heretics for poisoning their king, they would then catch a glimpse of the inverted sky and see all the world's fate. At this point, likely some of the sages, like Piero, would be against this notion. But the already weakened and muddled King Ermin still chose the Crimson Moon Sage's suggestions. Of which a similar event can be found from my favorite item in the game, the Silver Twig. A sage that hung himself upside down from a tree and found the secrets of the cosmos. 
This was a long-standing theory of mine from the Silver Twig and Conria finding the secrets of the Abyss. The only problem here before was that I thought it was King Ermin. But now maybe it was actually the heretic sages that poisoned King Ermin, who would have also drank the same crimson blood fire and was hung upside down in the Abyss. The true location of Erminsol is still unknown however, outside of growing downward into the abyss, so it being located somewhere near Conria that is also in the abyss is still possible. But that's enough theory for one video as I only wanted this to focus on Arlequino's origins. We can however discuss this in a different video on the theoretical, chronological telling of Conria's events. Now when it comes to the lore of Arlequino as well as the Crimson Moon and Conria, I didn't actually expect that it would reach this far into Conria's origins as well as the Moon Sisters and possibly even to the Primordial Era. So that and another look at the Gnostic Serpent and Gnosticism itself using the new lore of Arlequino is how we're gonna go over this next video. But I'll need to put some time into it and making sense of that theory first. For now, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like on if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!